as far as what I would like to cover here. What you're going to hear is a boil down of a four day program that I teach about how the Dutch, not the English, invented America. What about Henry Hudson? You forgot Henry Hudson? Henry Hudson was English and was an employee working for the Dutch. And we're going to learn about that too. Good. Okay. They never have found him, by the way. Listen to his accent. Anybody here with Dutch heritage? You guys are, keep your hands up. Are you familiar with this book? You better be, okay? And if you don't want to take the hard cover, get the, get the soft cover. Uh, there's a website called Abe Books, A-B-E-B-O-K-S, abebooks.com for out of print, used, and very, very competitively priced books. Um, I can't recommend them enough. Of the website? The island, we're going to talk about it. The island at the center of the world. What island do you think they were talking about? Manhattan Island. Exactly. We are legal. I can start. I don't need an introduction. I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Bob Ulrich. I am not a historian, but I am a historian. This is my retirement gift to myself. Uh, 30 years at IBM in Fishdale, a little bit at Poughkeepsie. When I retired, and I tell this to everybody I lecture to, those yellow and blue history signs you see on the side of the roads, check your rearview mirror, make sure there's nobody on your tail, slow up and read them. And some of them can change your life. Two of them were at the same church in Fishkill, the big, beautiful Dutch Reformed Church in Fishkill. I stopped one day and read it. I now teach a course about one of those signs. Guy by the name of Enoch Crosby. Anybody ever heard of Enoch Crosby? Congratulations. In James Fenimore Cooper's The Spy, there was a hero called Harvey Birch. Harvey Birch was Enoch Crosby. Turned out to be a double agent for the Americans during the Revolutionary War. And it's an incredible story. He's buried in uh, Carmel, the Pavilion Cemetery. Incredible cemetery. <coughs> 23 Revolutionary War veterans, including Enoch Crosby, were buried in the cemetery. In any case, history has become my passion. I started with this book, and it tells about how the Dutch coming up with Henry Hudson, who wasn't Dutch, even though there's a high school in Westchester called Hendrik Hudson High School. The Dutch hired him, but I'm stealing my own thunder. Ask any questions that you'd like when you have them. Let's not wait until the end of the lecture, because nobody's going to remember anything. And I love to say this at all of my presentations, because I remember how you smiled when you heard it from your professor in college. It won't be on the final. So just enjoy it. Take notes. If you have a question that you didn't ask or wanted to, grab a card. I have uh, my email address is on there. And send me an email with any questions, comments that you may have. I love these lapel mics because I can turn around and still keep talking. I thank you for having me down here. And especially, especially Gretchen. You've got quite an active events committee. In fact, I have a hard stop at 3.15. I have to get out of here no matter what chart I'm on. And I, I know which ones I want to get to. So I will be out of here because there is something planned at 3.30. 40 years from start to finish. It was over that quickly between the time the Dutch saw what was here. And they weren't the first ones. The pilgrims were up at Cape Cod in 1620, 1621. I always confuse the dates. The, the English were down in uh, Jamestown, 1607. So this wasn't the first, but it's an interesting story. The Dutch were here for 40 years before the British said, we messed up. We should have taken that piece in the middle between Connecticut and Virginia. We're going to do it right now. And that's, and that's what they did. The introduction to the story of Henry Hudson, we're going to talk about Vanderdonk's description of New Netherlands. Dutch words we use today, and you may not even realize that you're talking Dutch. 
the significance of the beaver trade. It was the beavers here that had been hunted to extinction in Europe that were used for the most expensive hats and coats. No longer existed in Europe, they discovered them here. Dutch gifts to America in all different ways. The most important gift was their gift of liberalism and how it left its mark on America and on our First Amendment. All good things must end when the English realized what they had forgotten. And I know we'll get to this, a Christmas present. I'll steal my own thunder. The Dutch invented Santa Claus. <laughs> Half St. Nicholas. We'll talk about that. The book that inspired me, and I already picked up the two copies on the end, The Island at the Center of the World. The story behind the book is so interesting. It's written by a gentleman by the name of Russell Shredo, who had heard, he was a, uh, a writer for the New York Times. He had heard about something going on up in Albany at the archives. This guy was taking old Dutch and translating it. 12,000 pages of parchments had been discovered, or had been stored at the archives in Albany. He was a PhD student at SUNY Albany, in language, and PhD students are on a measured track. And if you don't get to certain positions by a certain time, as they would say at IBM, you get downsized. And he was asked to drop out of the program. He went across town to the archives looking for a job. He said, anything for me? I said, what'd you teach? He said, 17th century German and Dutch. And their eyes opened up, don't go away. I love this story, don't go away. And they ran to the, to the wall, pulled out a page of parchment, brought it to him and said, can you read this stuff? Because it was a dead language. And he looked, he says, yes. And they said, okay, we'll be back. These were the leaders of Albany at the time who had been involved with, with developing the Empire State Plaza that we know today under Nelson Rockefeller. They were buddies with Rockefeller. Rockefeller was so embarrassed at the ghetto that Albany had turned into when hosting foreign dignitaries, he was behind what we see today up there. They went to Rocky, who was literally about to get on an airplane to head to Washington, D.C. Because if you remember when Richard Nixon finally said, I am not a crook, but I'm leaving anyway, his president, Jerry Ford, became president, and it was Nelson Rockefeller who became vice president. And they said, Rocky, Rocky, we're in trouble. And they told the story about this case. He said, well, what's the problem? He said, we got nothing in the budget, but we can't let him get away. He said, what are you talking about? And he said, $25,000. Well, I, I thought you were talking real money. This is 1770, 1975, okay? 25,000 was a significant piece of change. Charles Gehring was the student's name. Between 75 and 1995, he translated 6,000 of those 12,000 pages. Word got down to the Times. The Times sent Shorto up. Shorto, with Gehring, started going through the translations of those first 6,000 pages. And this is the book that came out of it. Shorto fell in love with the story. When he finished the book, he moved himself and his family over to Amsterdam. <laughs> For the next five years, when he wrote his second book, not his second, but his second book on, on the Dutch called Amsterdam, the most liberal city in Europe. The Dutch were known for their liberalism, and we'll talk about that. One of their major gifts to us, for sure. But I love the story of the book and how if this guy hadn't gotten thrown out of SUNY, we wouldn't be listening to me talk about it. Russell Schweino, the author, Charles Gehring. This is at Dutchess Community College. He was on a book tour. This was at Harris College. He was on a book tour. This is Charlie Gehring. Okay, and Russell Shorter describes this picture. This is in the, in the book. Don't nook it or kindle it because I don't think they have all the pictures and whatever. It becomes a great reference material. The appendix in the back, you can use it as a resource because of what they explain in here. And we'll go into that. There I am in, with Charlie in his office. He's become a close intellectual buddy. We're not social friends. 
I've invited him down a couple of times. He's very busy. He's still working up there with his staff now, working on those second 6,000 pages. He created the New Netherlands Institute. I went to pay him a visit and get his autograph. Amazing man, anytime I have any question on anything Dutch, I will send him an email, and within minutes, I get a, a very, very incredible response. So we saw the two guys, Shorto and Gehring, who uh, wrote the book, created the book. There are two other names. Peter Stuyvesant was the fifth and last governor of New Amsterdam, of New, New Netherlands. They had five, the Dutch had sent over five leaders, one at a time. He was the last one. He was there when the British decided to take over. And a guy by the name of Adrian van der Donk. Adrian van der Donk was the first attorney in the Western Hemisphere. He was the young graduate of Leiden University. The Dutch government did a very interesting thing. They wanted everything under their control from Manahara. Manahara was an Algonquin word that means Philly Island, Philly Place. We call it Manhattan today. The Dutch wanted everything between Manhattan and just north of Albany. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But anything north of Albany, they could play with. And they gave well over 100,000 acres to a gentleman by the name of Killian van Rensselaer, who was a diamond merchant back in the Netherlands. He had influence, obviously, with the parliament. The deal was, if we give you rights to property, you have to develop it within five years. So their job is then to get volunteers who want to start a new life, become indentured servants for five years, give them the equipment they need, tell them how big of a house they need to build on your property, and five years later, they get their freedom if they want. So Killian there in Sevier, and today we have RPI University named in his honor, Rensselaer County named in his honor. He never came over, he sent his sons over, and he hired this young man, Adrian Vanderdonk, to be his sheriff, justice of the peace, land manager. Vanderdonk got disenchanted pretty quickly and quit the job, went down to Manhattan to back box heads with Stuyvesant. Stuyvesant was a dictator, a martinet. He was tough. You had to be tough to do what he was doing. But they got into such turmoil that Stuyvesant literally wanted to have him executed. And then Dunham said, hold it, hold it, let's go back, let's go back home and bring this up in court. Okay. Stuyvesant lost. He comes back. His claim to fame, and the reason why Stuyvesant didn't have much of an argument, Stuyvesant's predecessor was a man by the name of Wilhelm Kieft. He turned out to be a reprobate. He was totally the wrong man for the job. He was a drinker, and he had no feeling for the association that the Dutch wanted and had made with the local natives. When the French came in, they were trackers. They would track the animals, send the dogs home. The Dutch didn't get their hands messy. They brought over stuff from Europe that the local indigenous tribes didn't have but wanted. And what they did was trade. In fact, they went one step further. There were no, we call them wampum beads. The real name is Sewan, and you'll learn that in this book. There was no Sewan up in the Hudson Valley, but it certainly existed on Long Island Sound. So the Dutch traders would make a stop in Connecticut with the Pequot Indians, trade for Sewan beads, and then bring the beads up and start trading up here. But also brass kettles and guns to hunt with, and the gunpowder, and the lead to make the balls with. Okay, so they were traitors. Keith didn't appreciate that. Started an Indian war. And here's where the story gets interesting. That's the last thing the Dutch government wanted, because those were our trading partners, they felt. Vanderdonk ended it. He stopped the war. That was his claim to fame. As a thank you person, this gets into the section on wars, Dutch words we speak today and don't realize it. When it was over, as a thank you, they gifted him a piece of property. A piece of property. Property went from Van Portland Park to today's Croton train station, the Croton River. It's Westchester County. He set up a mill right in the middle. If you were English, 
He certainly wasn't royalty, but he certainly wasn't poor any longer. If he were English, he would be known as a squire. The Dutch didn't have the word squire. They had a different word, spelled J-O-N-K-E-E-R with a soft J. He was a Jonkier. He was a Jonkier right in the middle of Westchester with a mill, a very successful mill. And people would say, I'm going up to visit the Young Cure. I'm going up to Young Cure's place. Well, just like the New York Yankees changed it to Y-A-N-K-E-E, Yankee was a very popular Dutch name. Also a very popular Bronx baseball team. Okay, the Y is pronounced. It was J-A-N Young. Yankees. Okay, that's where the, the name Yankee came from. So they would say, I'm going up to visit the Yankee, the Yankee, and today it's called Yonkers. I'm going up to Yonkers place. They took the J-A out, put a Y in, and that's, that's why Yonkers is called Yonkers. This is a cannon that was discovered when they were building the original World Trade Center, because the original World Trade Center was at the heart of what was the Dutch settlement of New Amsterdam. And what's interesting, this is a, an exhibit at the uh, Museum of the City of New York. Look at the two pictures on the wall. And we've seen those two pictures already. Okay, this is Vanderdunk. Probably not Vanderdunk for real, but it's as close as anybody can get. And Stuyvesant. What started the adventure of the trade history? The the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, had taken Constantinople. And if you all know the song, Istanbul is Constantinople, they changed the name, whatever. They had a major issue with permitting Spanish Catholics to use the Silk Road because of all the Crusades that had preceded them. So couldn't trade here anymore. You had to find a different way to get to Asia. You had to find a different way to get to, to China. Constantinople fell, renamed Istanbul. The Portuguese started to sail around Africa. That was a heck of a journey, especially when it's wind, okay, and especially when there's pirates. So it was dangerous, it was long. Everybody was looking for a Northwest Passage. Everybody was sailing. The Dutch Muscovy Company, the British Muscovy Company hired Henry Hudson Englishman to find the Northwest Passage, 1607, 1608. He tried it and he failed. Got ice down, went back home. He got fired, terminated, downsized. The Dutch picked him up, bought him a, bought him a ship. In fact, they even described the ship. We will get the Englishman a ship of 35 tons. I'll go back over this, 35 tons in which he can sail 12 crew, six, or maybe 16 crew, half and half, half Dutch, half English. Hudson didn't even speak Dutch, but he had translators. They formed the Dutch East India Company to do their trading in the Far East. They set up legal monopolies, and they also said, you can have your own army to protect whatever you're doing. So now the Dutch had two armies, the National Army and the Dutch East India Company. Years later, after Hudson, well, not that long, Hudson came up in 1609. I'll talk about this in a second. Came up in 1609, failed at finding a Northwest Passage, but said, we're not going home this time. We're going, we're going west. I know there's something there. Maybe we can find a way to India quickly. And he didn't, but he discovered the South River, which is the Delaware River. He discovered the Fresh River, which is the Connecticut River. He discovered the Great River, the North River, which is the Hudson River, but he didn't call it the, the Hudson River. It was the English 40 years later who renamed it after their, their employee 
The Dutch created a world financial system. 1609, same year as Hudson's voyage, they created the Bank of Amsterdam, introduced a series, a system of debits and credits. They introduced the first checking accounts in the world. Okay, you could write a check against your bank account. They began minting coins of uniform weights and standard values that became European standards. No matter what you were trading in, if you were trading with florins, okay, it was easy to get what you wanted because everybody recognized the florin. 1609 to 1621, a 12-year truce with Spain. And that's all they needed, time to inhale and get creative. And so many things came out of the Netherlands, including paintings. Okay, some of the most incredible artwork is all about this 12-year truce period. Because now they can concentrate on commerce, not war. Manufacturing flourished. All classes, upper class, lower class, got involved in producing trade goods. Timber from the Baltics, salt from France, spices from the East, sugar from the West Indies, and eventually sugar from Brazil, and I hope to be able to get to that before we finish. Salt from France, I gotta take a detour for a quick second. I teach another course called Tidbits and Factoids, Fun Tidbits and Factoids, and I've got 75 things that I've amassed one of them is an interesting word, okay? But let me back it up by saying, in the old days, one of the universally accepted pieces of merchandise was salt. Salt was needed by everybody because it was the only way, it was one of the only ways to preserve meat. You could smoke it, but mostly you salted it, and it would stay for quite a while. Roman troops got paid in salt rations quite often. We have an expression, are you worth your salt? Is he worth his salt? That was what he was getting paid with. That's what he was getting paid with. The Latin word for salt is sal. You get paid a salary. And now you know where the word salary comes from. Different program, different course. I've got 74 others of those. Maybe someday we'll get into that. The Ottomans gave trading privileges to the Dutch the Dutch were Protestants. They weren't those nasty Catholics that had started the Crusades, not to the Spanish. The war with Spain resumed in 1621. And now to augment the Dutch East India Company, they created the Dutch West India Company. That took care of the Western Hemisphere. And this is the third army the Dutch had, because they let this, these bunch of traders have their own, their own arms to protect themselves. This replaced what had been called the New Netherlands Company. Trade prospered. Fur belts, once again available in Europe, the finest hats and coats, South America, sugar and salt flourished. The Dutch became the greatest trading nation in the world. At one time, they had something like 10,000 merchant ships out and about. One of the other things they did was they invented the stock market. I told you about check, checkbooks and checking accounts. They invented the stock market. If you bought yourself a ship to do commerce with and invested all you had into the ship, pirates, a storm, took the ship down, you were out of luck. And what they did was to start selling shares. You could buy 2% of 50 ships. If a ship went down, you still had 90%, 98% of your investment. And what is owning a share of stock today? It's, it's the same thing. It's the same concept. So you could say the Dutch actually started what we today call the stock market. They control over 50% of all European commerce. 1624, the Dutch settlers. 30 families came over to New Amsterdam. It wasn't New Amsterdam then. It was a place called Nut Island. Nut Island because it was this small island that had nut trees. Remember the name Nut Island? Peter Minuet took half of them up to Albany. And that was his plan, to settle half here and keep half down here. 
What was so important about this? Albany was the intersection of America's first two superhighways. Superhighways. There were no planes, there were no trains. It was the Hudson River that could get you up to Albany, and then you had the Mohawk River that could get you to Lake Ontario. And look what happens once you get to Lake Ontario, you can get to the Mississippi River. And once you get to the Mississippi River, Everything in red is a body of water that will get you to the Mississippi. So you can get to the Mississippi and then get yourself back to the Mohawk, get yourself down to New York, and then get your goods over to Europe and reverse it in the other direction. This is an interesting map that a geologist, Skip uh, Dejulia from CLS, taught me this lesson. This is a contour map. Everything brown is a mountain. But take a look at this. Can you take take a car? When you take the New York State Thruway, it's not there by accident. It's there because you don't have to go over any mountains. It's also the path that the Mohawk River flows in. The Erie Canal paralleled the Mohawk River. Okay. It was formed back in the Ice Ages, and we can see it very clearly. Okay, the you're literally at sea level when you're on the, uh, on the throughway. There's still a lot of Dutch influence up in that area. Okay, if you take the throughway going west of Buffalo, you go through, go past next to Amsterdam, New York. There's a lot of in New York. Down near Albany, Slingerlands is a Dutch name from a Dutch place back home, and Gilgelman is a Dutch, is a Dutch word. Okay, trade history. When Mignolet tried to drop the 15 families up in Albany, the local indigenous tribe said, we don't feel comfortable. Too many, too many rabbit eyes. They can't stay. He said, can I meet one or two here as traders? And they said, that is fine. Everybody else got on board. They headed back to Nut Island, and they looked as they were coming in, there was this beautiful piece of property that they were passing that happened to be by the Usopus Creek. And they said, that looks like good farmland. Half the, half the people got off there. The town records of Kingston were maintained in the Dutch language until 1860. That was the beginning of the Dutch presence up in Usopus and Kingston. The rest of them came back to that island this is not island today, we call it Governor's Island. And Minuet said, wait a minute, this, this is never gonna be big enough for what I want to do. And he saw what this was, and he went and made a deal. The famous, famous deal for, this is in Dutch, so don't be afraid, it's not your eyes. 60 guilders, 60 guilders worth of trinkets and beads and junk, he bought Manhattan Island. Not a bad deal. This document is called the Schengen Brief because it was a document sent home by Peter Schengen that described what was going on here. And he said they had purchased the island Manhattan from the Indians for the value of $60. This literally is the bill of sale for Manhattan Island. It also tells about what was being shipped back home on this, on this first load of. Uh, of goodies. Henry Hudson, I won't spend a lot of time on this. It was the third voyage he made. And by the way, sadly, his fourth voyage was the voyage where he named Hudson Bay in Canada, thinking that was the way to get to India. A couple of his sailors got sick. The rest of his sailors wanted to get home. He wanted to stay over, winter over, and they mutinied. They sent he and his son and some of the six sailors off to the shore. His remains have never been found, but he is somewhere on the shore of Hudson Bay. But the big deal was 1609, the year before, in, in the Half Moon. There was a full replica of the Half Moon that sailed up and down the Hudson for several years. Gentlemen, further north, 
built it out of his own funds. He just couldn't keep it financially stable, and he finally had to sell it. Fortunately, it was purchased by the museum. Unfortunately, the museum is in the Netherlands. But it's, <laughs> it still exists. It hasn't been lost to history. On the notes, Hudson's notes from the trip were confiscated by the British government. It lost to history. When a country had it, a, uh, an exploration going out, they didn't want to share what was found to the world. They paid for it, they wanted it for themselves. So they confiscated Hudson's log books, even though he wasn't working for the British then. Okay, but it was, he was lucky he didn't lock him up in jail. But his first mate, Robert Jewett, was keeping quite a log, and we have notes. He details this is a beautiful place. He details meeting local native tribes, the Manhattans, the Rockaways, the Canarsis. Aren't those names interesting? Okay. They weren't places. They were the names of the Indian tribes that they were dealing with. This is the story about, about Jewett. Quote, this is September 4th, 1609. Quote, this, the day, this day, people of the country came aboard seemingly very glad of our coming, brought green tobacco, and gave it of us for knives and beads. They go in deerskin, well-dressed, they desire cloth and are very civil. We went on land to walk on the west side of the river. We're on the west side of the river. They found good ground for corn and other garden herbs with a great store of oaks and walnuts and chestnut trees, yew trees and trees with sweetwood in great abundance and a great store of slate for houses and other good stones. And he goes on and on about what, what they were finding here. This is in fact New Amsterdam. That was the community. This was farmland, but the houses ended at a street where they built a wall. Guess what the name of that street was today? And it is, to, and it wasn't to keep the Indians out. They were trading with the Indians. It was to keep the English out. Okay, so they had guards on the wall to keep it from being attacked by the English. Okay, and today it's Wall Street. A lot of these names still exist to this day. It's also why when you get way downtown in New York, and by the way, New York now extends way out to here and here because of landfill, but when you get in here, the streets are all circuitous. They were cow paths probably back, back in the old days. There it is looking at it from the water. I haven't looked recently, but there was a 57 minute video. If you Google Dutch New York, you will get this story. You don't want to buy the book or read the book. Dutch New York, and it is what you're hearing about today. It's that whole story. They did a great job. <laughs> Vanderdonk, when he came back down to New York, to New Amsterdam, realized that he needed to get more Dutch people over here because the English were going to take it. He was right. He didn't live to see that day, but he was right. He wrote this book called The Description of the New Netherlands. It never became famous because it was never translated into English. Up in Massachusetts, Bradford's Plymouth Plantation is a famous book about the life of the Pilgrims and the Puritans and what they were doing on a daily basis. So was this, but it was in Dutch. It was translated in the late 1800s poorly. It has been retranslated, and it's interesting because the forward of this book is written by Russell Shorter. So if you are looking for it in a bookshop, make sure you get the right version. They did it this time. Charlie Daring did a lot of the translation work to correct some of the errors in the, in the, in the first book. But what I find amazing in here, these are the chapter headings. It's a small book, it's an easy read. But what I thought was incredible was a whole entire chapter. Vanderdunk is having a conversation with a local native, talking about everything. Do you believe in afterlife? What are your marriage ceremonies like? Do you believe in, in God? Do you believe everything? Medicines, plants, 
These are the chapter headings, okay? And understand, it's right in our backyard. It could have been right outside here. This took place somewhere near the umpire's place, this conversation. It's, it's a tremendous piece of, of history of what life was like. And then we get into the next piece of why did they stay here in the first place? Because they discovered they discovered beavers. Does anybody recognize this? Anybody here familiar with or live on the east side of Manhattan? Anybody here ever take the Lexington Avenue local? If you got out, I won't tell you where. I won't tell you where yet. They were sending home pictures of beavers that they discovered here. And here we see the typical, I'm saying that facetiously, beaver condominium, the three level condo. This is great. <laughs> this is what the Italians were being told. This is, this is how the beaver trade. So if you stand up there and you shoot these guys, they're three level size. Obviously this isn't, this isn't true, but it's what they were promoting as the, as the beaver trade. Everything was in barter. There was no coinage here. Everything was literally valued in beaver pets. Gunpowder, muskets, lead balls, lead to melt into balls, and sadly, rum. Alcohol became a major, major problem, and is to this day, if you ever visit many Indian reservations, the percentage of alcoholism. It's sad because you will learn in, in this book, the natives knew grapes, they knew crushing grapes, they knew grape juice. They knew nothing about fermentation or what you could produce with it. There was not even a word in the Dutch language to describe being drunk. And think about what a problem it is for them today. A lot of the land deals in the ensuing years were made only after a few drinks and the locals had no idea what they were signing title over to. This is an idea of the legal belt. 40,000 pelts went out in 16, was it 56? Yeah, 1656. Trade in legal belts. And even today, in Manhattan, okay, not only is there a Beaver Street, but if you take a look at the, the seal of the city of New York, Okay, a local European, a local indigenous native, beaver, beaver, and this is probably grain that was crushed by the window that was part of the New Amsterdam settlement. But let's get back to that, that piece of terracotta that I showed you. If you get off the train at Astor Street, in fact, if you get off at Astor Place, here it is. <laughs> it's a local stop, so you don't really have a reason to get on and off, unless you're going to Cooper Union College or you want to take a walk over to St. Mark's Church where Peter Stuyvesant happens to be buried today. Astor made two fortunes. His second fortune was in New York City real estate. His first fortune was in fur trading. To the point where he set up a trading post on the West Coast in Oregon, Astoria, Oregon, was named after, after, after Astor. And it's interesting, this is the state flag of Oregon. It's the only state flag that is two-sided. And look what they have on the back side. <laughs> Everything was bartered. Three beaver skins for a gun, two for eight pounds of powder, or 40 pounds of lead. And this is some lithographs from the 1800s. This one is called the natives arriving with the pelts. And here they're about to start bargaining. Without the beaver, there would have been no Fort Orange, which is Albany, no New Amsterdam, and probably no New Netherlands. So let's talk for a minute about the beaver, especially if you're an engineer. This is an amazing story. The beavers do two things that are incredible. Now, the one they build a home, they call the beaver lodge. This is a beaver lodge. You see a pile like this in a creek, you know there's beavers around. They build the lodge first, but only after they've discovered a source of water. 
because once the laws is finished, the opening that they had built will be underwater. <coughs> then they go to work on damming up this piece of wood. Now think about that, okay? They won't let them into the library and the research department. This is all instinctive. They build the lodge, they build the dam. And there's a game that they play over at Vassar Farms where there is a beaver lodge uh, and a dam. Every once in a while they yank out a couple of, of logs from the, uh, from the dam. And within a few minutes, all of a sudden, you'll see the workers out there figuring out why is the water level in our home going down. Okay, this is that opening. There is no opening above ground. <coughs> but when they're building this thing, it's all <coughs> the water level. It's such an incredible story that the beaver has become, oh, this is kind of cute. The beavers were hunted and hunted and hunted. They fought back as best they could. Too little, too late. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to use that. It didn't matter. College mascots. CCNY, City College of New York. What more appropriate mascot could they have than a beaver? And in fact, they do. But even better than that, I mean, they even have a graduate. That's the, that's the college ring, the CCNY, that was 40 years old. It used to be more prominent. Does anybody recognize this? has a nickname, it's called the Brass Rat. Any engineers in the crowd? No, but good guess. MIT. That is their college ring, okay? That's the homage that they are paying to the beaver. But it goes one step further because there's another renowned college on the West Coast. In fact, it's called the MIT of the West Coast. Caltech. That's Caltech's mascot. They call themselves, they call MIT the Caltech of the East Coast. Oregon State also has the beaver as a mascot. Pardon? Oregon State's mascot is beaver. How appropriate. Look at their flag. It's not pronounced Oregon. It's Oregon. Like gnarls. <laughs> Fortunately for the beavers, silk replaced beaver fur for making the finer clothing, so they were given a respite. Dutch words we use today. This gets really cute. The homicidal Dutch. I was leading a bus tour of Midwesterners. The woman that I worked for had a touring company in the Hudson Valley. Um, I forget the name of the company, but she ran these day tours. They would bring in groups from out of state and she would grab them and do the Hudson Valley with them. And I worked for her as a, as a guide on the buses. And there's one group from the Midwest had a very interesting question. And they said, why were there so many murders in this area? And it caught me up. I said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, we, on the way up here, we drove through Peekskill, and then we drove through Fishkill, and we're heading up to Catskill, and Wallkill. And I said, ah. Uh, anybody know where this is going? Yeah. The Dutch word, good, means stream, or body of water. That's all it means, to answer the question. But I, and it, like I said, it was a very honest question on my her part. Okay. Pardon? Anita Williams' pet? Yeah. Was it Anita Williams' pet? It was the person she bought the company from. It was March Short. Aristocrat Shores, thank you. Okay, she sold the business to, to Anita. I went and picked up a pencil and paper, kept it on my dashboard, and I started a list <laughs> of kills and more. Okay, Stony Kill, we know right down on, on, on the uh, Do any of you ever get down on 9D or Renegade Stadium at all? If you go south past the main entrance to Stony Kill, you'll see a barn and a big pond and a second entrance. And in that second entrance, and I don't have it here, is a stone house. 
And I driven by that stone house for 35 years. I finally decided to go in. And they have a descriptive panel. That house was a tenant's house. And they have a copy of the deed. And it tells you how big a house he had to build. And it tells you how many peach trees, how many apple trees, how many plum trees he had to, to plant in order to have the rights to farm that land and give a certain percentage of his crop to the landlord, the landowner. Let's talk about more names. Berkelin. Berkelin is a town in the Netherlands that had muddy, broken up land. And that's what they were reminded of when they named a spot in today's Brooklyn, Brooklyn. It's a spot near the ferry station. That was the original town of Brooklyn. It was not a borough at, at, at the time. Bushwick is Dutch, a town in the woods. Blackaboos. Blackaboos got renamed. <laughs> The Flatbush. When the British came in, they renamed just about everything. Gravesend is Count's Beach, and it is, in fact, on the beach. New Utrecht reminded them of Utrecht back home. Midwood was Middlewoods between two major, major places. Konya Island must have been filled with rabbits, because Konya is the Dutch word for rabbit. The other interesting one is Staten Island. Now, if you look at a map, Staten Island is the first piece of land that you will encounter when you're coming in from the ocean, before you get to Manhattan. And the closer you look at it, the more you realize it really should be part of New Jersey. But the Dutch claimed it along with Nut Island and then Manhattan, so it became part of New York. The word Staten Island is interesting. They wanted to honor their parliament back home. Parliament was the Stockton General, the States General, and that became Stockton Island, States Island. That's where the name Staten Island comes from. Harlem, Harlem was the town back home, and 125th Street, the heart of Harlem here. Yankee, Yankee was a very popular male name. If you didn't know somebody's name, you called Yankee. Hello, Yankee. And that's where the baseball name, Yankees. Again, that soft J, as in the Yankee. If you have ever been on board a yacht and met the skipper, you are talking Dutch. You don't have to translate them because those are two Dutch words. The other interesting one, we, we know we're not English. Our kids come home and have milk and cookies. If we were British, we would be eating, feeding them milk and biscuits. Okay, and you don't work for a master. If you were British, your boss would be a master. But here, your boss is your boss, because B-A-S-S, -S, boss, is the Dutch word for the guy you work for. He's your boss. You've been talking Dutch and speaking Dutch all this time, and you didn't know it. This is the Angel Traffic Circle going south just before you get to Peekskill. I call it my double header. This is to Fishkill, this is to Peekskill. And right over here, on this little island of land, is a sign that gives you Jan Peek Bridge, named to commemorate where Jan Peek on the stream had his trading post where he would trade with all the indigenous tribes. So that was Jan Peek's stream is peace, Hill. A stoop. Dutch has so much water, they decided to raise their houses one level. So there were stairs going up. The stairs were called a stoop, small porch or platform. Broadway, originally, the Dutch word was Bedeed Bed. Oh, this is a story about the young Kira. Okay. Oh, this is kind of cute. Duffel cloth, duffel bag. This, this is what's his face? Uh, Paddington. Paddington there, and this is his duffel coat with the toggles. And this is in in uh, 
in the Netherlands. We visit Cape May in Jersey. Cornelius May was a Dutch explorer. And once you've been there, your next spring vacation is going to be at Bach Island, named after Adrian van der Donk, another Dutch explorer. Okay, that one. This is interesting. Here's the wall. That was the end of the, the civilized place. There's the wall. That was Wall Street. Stuyvesant had built himself quite an estate north of the wall. That was his farm. The Dutch word for farm is Bowery. Spelled with W's and J's pronounced Bowery. So it's that's where we get the, the term from. Dutch gifts to America. I'll go through this quickly. Games we play, okay? Bowling was brought over by the Dutch. Ice skating. Many, many pictures of ice skating. A lot of them by this guy, Hendrik Overkamp. A different scene on the ice. And I thought this is kind of interesting because look what they were playing. They were playing ice golf. This is 1625. So next time you're out on the golf course, think about where that sport, where that sport came from. Again, this title of the painting, a game of golf on the ice. And so many children's games, a lot of them 450 years old. This is Peter Grail, the elder. This is a self-portrait with his money bags. This was his uh, sponsor at the time. Okay, who paid for his work. Some of Grail's most known works, The Tower of Babel, Adoration of the Kings, The Peasant's Wedding. This one I remember for an art history course in college, Hunters in the Snow. These are all Grail's. This one's not that well known, it should be. It's Grail's Children's Games. Within this painting, there are over 80 activities. Mm -hmm. Rolling hoops and rings, Johnny on the pony, riding the barrel. I mean, a lot of us played some of these games as kids. Pole play, leapfrog. The master painters of the Dutch Golden Age, I told you that 12 years of peace with the Spanish. Okay, it produced Uh, this is Franz Hall, I think it is. Let's see. Moon play by Franz Hall. Okay, another Abercomp winter scene. Vermeer's milkmaid. Rembrandt's self-portrait. And all of those yummy baked treats. I said we eat cookies, not biscuits. Children would line up. The cook would test the heat of the oven with some dough and that that would be the kids treats before she started baking the breads cookie means little cake in addition to just cookies this is a book that was found up in the cia archives in poughkeepsie the, the standard cook the sensible cook and it lists all these recipes from several hundred years ago, 1668. Okay, there's a modern translation that was done by a local woman by the name of Peter Rose, the sensible cook, where she gives you the recipes, here she is. Interesting first name, I don't know where it came from. Coleslaw is thought to be German, it's not, it's the Americanized version of cool salad, Dutch cool salad, cabbage salad. Mayonnaise hadn't been invented yet, but in this cookbook, there's a recipe for making cabbage using melted butter, vinegar, and oil. Basically, what you're doing with mayonnaise. And for any of the scientists, Adrian Anthony von Leeuwenhoek discovered the first microscope. 200 power magnification. He saw these tiny little things moving, and he called them animalcules. We call them bacteria, but it was the first time that they had ever been seen. Leaves us with three very special gifts from the Dutch. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, his wife's uncle, Theodore Roosevelt, and there was a third Dutch president, 
wants to sign the here today? Anybody? Martin Graham Martin Graham Came from Kinderhook. Love Kinderhook. In fact, his nickname was Old Kinderhook. Sometimes he would just sign the document for his review. Okay. That's another one of those 74 tiny tidbits. That's where the expression came from. Dutch liberalism, probably the greatest gift. I should have had these out at the beginning. I, I just want to get the glasses out. I got it stuck between my iPad. The Netherlands was the most progressive society in Europe. Liberalism was their mainstay. People would come from many, many other countries where there was religious persecution and end up in the Netherlands. Interesting story, the, the pilgrims. We all know they came over here in 1620. But they had to stop before they came here. This wasn't their first choice. They were kicked out of England when England passed a law preventing the practice of the way they were teaching their religion. So they were persona non grata. Where did they end up? They went east to lighten the Netherlands. And they were there for 12 years. And the only reason they came over here was they felt uncomfortable with their kids growing up in such a liberal society. <laughs> they wanted a place where they wouldn't be touched. So they weren't really practicing religious freedom when they came here. They wanted exclusion. They wanted to be amongst themselves, by themselves, and, and don't bother us. But it was 12 years back in the Netherlands. It all started a long time ago. OK, active act against pyramids was the law passed in 1593. No government censorship of literature. You paid, they would print it, which really becomes incredible because 50% of all the literature in Europe was published in Leiden. Descartes, I am, therefore, <coughs> I think, therefore, I am, OK, published in Leiden. Galileo, Discourse and Demonstration Mathematics, <laughs> Galileo Galilei, in Leiden, 1638, because of some of the things that he was professing in his book. The Dutch gave equal rights to women as opposed to the English. If you were a wife in England and your husband died, all of his estate went to the eldest son in the family. You did not have inheritance rights. As far as the Dutch, all ages, all genders, not just the eldest, not just males. Kay Heimowitz was an American historian. Dutch fur traders, English merchants, sons, random fortune seekers from Spain and Norway, Welsh tavern keepers, Gaelic blacksmiths, religious dissidents, a smattering of Jews and free slaves, somehow managed to conduct business, even while speaking 18 different languages. Interesting story about what Stuyvesant did with the Quakers. He hated anybody that wasn't Calvinist. Truly hated them to the point where he wanted them arrested. And if you were a Quaker, he would profess that if he had the power, he would have you executed. So the Quakers realized they were not welcome down here. They moved way, way out of the day. The subway hadn't been finished yet. To a place called Blissingen. Blissingen today is Flushing, Queens. He, they moved into a predominantly English area. Bowne <coughs> was English, his wife was a Quaker. 
and he permitted them to hold their services in his home. And the bound house is still there in Flushing. Hmm. Stuyvesant wanted him arrested. The neighbors got together and created something called the Flushing Remonstrance and sent it back to the Netherlands and said, what is this guy trying to do? This is a copy of it. Part of those 12,000 pages up in the archives. Okay, the reason for the burn, 1911, there was a huge fire in the newly built archives and library up in Albany. And it destroyed literally two million Indian artifacts that were being stored up there. And it destroyed some of the parchments, but this was still readable. The Remonstrance was the first colonial document to express the idea of religious liberty, which a hundred years later became part of our Bill of Rights, our First Amendment. Russell Shorto says it's a vital antecedent in our, in our Constitution. What it said was, if any of these said persons come in love unto us, we cannot lay violent hands upon them, but give them free entry and exit from our society. Today, with a few blocks of the Bound House, a visit to the Flushing will encounter a Dutch Reformed Church, a Quaker Meeting House, an Episcopal Church, a Jewish synagogue, a Catholic Church, a Hindu Temple, a Muslim Mosque, all coexist in peace in the most diverse neighborhood, in the most diverse borough, in the most diverse city on the planet. Very quickly, the English realized they had messed up royally by not grabbing this land. They sent over a peace mission, which turned out to be not a peace mission. It was a small naval armada. They gave Stuyvesant a choice. Okay, give up right now or we attack. And if you fire one cannon, we will destroy everything that's here. And look at those people from Connecticut. Okay, there's New Englanders who are just waiting to get their hands on the goodies in here. He said, let me get back home and come back with an okay. And he went back to the Netherlands and he said, I don't have a choice. Can I stay if they let me? And the answer was, do what you have to do and yes, you can stay. So he came back, he surrendered it. There was no fighting. He remained there and lived out his life there. And he's buried there today. I'll show you in a minute where he's buried. The problem that he had was that one third of the people there weren't even Dutch. They weren't going to give up their lives to fight for the Dutch possession. So he knew he didn't have enough people to fight against this modest armada that had, that had shown up. Oh, the impact. The Dutch, this is short old writing, the Dutch brought their Pragmatic tolerance, their aggressive free trading sensibility, these got fused into the bedrock of Manhattan Island. When the English took over, they saw that the island was functioning like no other place in North America. They kept things just as it was. Lastly, with a ho, 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 the Dutch invented Santa Claus. <laughs> the legend goes back to St. Nicholas, Bishop of Myra. Myra, Myra is a place in Asia Minor, Turkey today. December 6th, 343 AD. December 6th was his saint's day. This is an early depiction of St. Nicholas. Two Dutch kids, the little girls, getting nice little goodies. The boy must have been bad. Nothing but Bertrands to get spanked with. Why are gifts appropriate? The legend that goes along with the St. Nicholas story is the fact that back in these ages, and this is true, if you didn't have, as a young girl, if your family didn't have money for a dowry, you were not marriageable, okay? There had to be some cash involved. If your family was poor, you were gonna have to find some other way to make a living. And oftentimes, that was ill repute, not, not very tasty ways to make, make a living. The bishop felt bad about this one particular family that had three daughters. And the story goes that he approached the house secretly. There was an open window and he threw a bag of gold in. There were socks drying by the fireplace. 
Great shot, you belong on the basketball team. Not once, not twice, but three times. He landed three bags of gold. That would be enough for each of the three daughters to have a dowry. So he gave them a future. And that was held to be quite an accomplishment and quite a reason to hold him in very, very high, high regard. In fact, he's also the, saint, the patron saint of corn burgers. <laughs> and there we see the three bags of gold outside the corn burger shop. Okay, but it gets better than that. Even Rudolph's sled pulling buddies show their Dutch heritage. Donder is the Dutch word for thunder. Blitzen is the Dutch word for lightning. St. Nicholas was so important, he was considered the unofficial patron saint of New Amsterdam. There is even in, uh, up on the Upper West Side, St. Nicholas Avenue. When do we celebrate? Well, everybody gets their gifts on December 25th. Not at all. The Dutch gave their gifts on December 6th, St. Nicholas's same day. Okay. And the English kids were always jealous because they're Dutch friends were getting their Christmas presents two weeks early. And it was the English that went to the Dutch and said, you know, life would be so much calmer. Would you just hold on for two more weeks and wait till Christmas Eve? But to this day, if you go up to Rhinebeck, does anybody know where I'm going with this? If you go up to Rhinebeck on the Saturday closest to December 6th, circle your calendar, the Saturday closest to December 6th, is called Sinterklaas Day. And they go nuts. There he is arriving at the train station. And let's take a look at some of the locals. Okay, it is a wonderful, wonderful day. The hardest part about the whole day is finding a parking spot. In fact, it's so hard that as a fundraiser, they even have a raffle up there. Okay, they have a couple of parking spots reserved for the raffle, for the raffle winners. But I would see if you can convince the powers to be here to, to take one of the vans and, and get a group of you up there. It is a great day. The image changes. This was 1881, Thomas Nash, a visit from St. Nicholas. Coca-Cola enters the scene. But how different really is it? Okay, there it is today. There it is in 1881. I can, I can sense, I can sense a similarity between the two. The more things change, the more they remain the same. So what do we do? We studied, we studied about Henry Hudson. We studied about Vanderbilt Dunk, the significance of the beaver trade, Dutch words we use today, the Dutch gifts to America, including our three presidents, Dutch liberalism and its mark on America, how the English took over, Santa Claus. Question. You didn't mention one of the so-called gifts of the Dutch was the slave trade. They brought the first slaves to this country. Yeah, it certainly wasn't a gift. It was it was commerce. Yes. yes. Okay, and they have apologized. Absolutely, I think they they were. Everybody was involved with the slave trade, but let me strip that one back one level further that we don't learn in school. If it wasn't for the African tribes on the west coast of Africa, there would have been no slave trade. The Arabs came in and wanted to buy slaves because they could sell them to the Europeans. Terrible, they did it. The Arabs were not gonna go capture slaves. They hired the west African tribes to go east, bring back slaves, they paid them, then they turned them over to the Europeans. So it's a dirty story, but you gotta tell the whole story. And there are some African Americans who have gone back and traced their lineage and said, oh my God, my great, 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 great was the leader of one of those tribes that made the slave trade possible. So, okay, and the Dutch have officially apologized. Yes, sir. I, I came in late, but how did, how did Peter Cyrus lose his life? I'm sorry? How did Peter Stuyvesant lose his leg? leg? He, he lost his leg in fighting in the, in the Caribbean, a cannon shot. Oh, because? Uh, the question was, how did Stuyvesant lose his leg? They called him that leg. Right. 
I, I'm saying that because Lionel, who's a resident here, and I went to uh, Stuyvesant High School, and we oh. and the football team and the sports teams were called the peg legs, but I don't remember <laughs> anyone it. mentioning how he lost his leg. He lost it in the, in the Caribbean from a cannon shot, probably a British cannon shot. Any other questions? Sir? Uh, it, it was actually uh, shot in the same part of the Caribbean. I'm sorry? So oh. His leg is buried in St. Uh, Martin's in the Caribbean. St. Martin's, Martin's funny guy, he's buried in two different places. St. Martin's is that island in the Caribbean that's cut in the middle. Half of it is French, Saint-Martin, and half is Dutch. St. Martin's. Yes, thank you. I forgot about that. And he's buried. By the way, if you take the Lexington Avenue local and get off that extra place, go look at our beam. Walk up, go wave it to the Union, and start walking east and you'll come to St. Mark's Church, which was a Dutch Reformed Church. They lost the congregation, and they gave Stuyvesant's heirs, gave it to anybody that would keep it as a religious institution. It's now an Episcopal Church. But he's got a stained glass window with his image on it, mm -hmm. and a crypt is there where his remains are, to this day buried. Any other questions? I've got five minutes, okay? I'm not going to go to my charts. I've got five minutes to tell you what I was going to do for an encore, and I don't have time to do it all. But it's one of the other things that I realized was of significance is the connection between the Dutch and the Jewish population of New York City. What's the connection? The connection is 128%. It's huge. When the Spanish Inquisition hit Spain, the Jews in Spain either had to bail out or convert to Catholicism. Some of them bailed out and went on voyages to find a new place to live. And they went to a place called Brazil. They landed on the coast in a city called Recife, and they stayed there. And while there, they created the sugar trade. They created the sugar industry in Brazil, which today produces 40% of the world sugar. About 10 or 15 years after the Inquisition in Catholic Spain, their next door neighbor, Catholic Portugal, had their Inquisition. And again, the Jews either had to convert or bail out. And they ended up in Brazil. Again, some of them. Spain ceded Spain and the Dutch were fighting. We, we learned about that. Okay, they gained the possession of Brazil. They used to trade these islands off like chess pieces. They gained Brazil. The Spanish now had Brazil. They gave Brazil to the Portuguese, and the Portuguese gift. They brought the Inquisition with them. So the Jews there had that decision: convert or bail out. Twenty-three Jews got on a ship that was heading for the Amsterdam. It was attacked by pirates twice. They arrived in New Amsterdam without anything except their lives. Peter Stuyvesant did not want them there. Peter Stuyvesant hated anybody who wasn't a Calvinist Protestant. Mostly Catholics he hated because of the Inquisition, I'm sure, and the, and the war in Spain, okay? But Quakers, we learned about that. This happened three years before the Flushing Remonstrance. Stuyvesant said, you're not welcome here. Get out. Now understand, these weren't 23 average run of the mill people. These were 23 people who came from this sugar industry in Brazil. They all had friends back home in Parliament. They wrote and said, would you stop this guy from throwing us out of here? Parliament read it, and I've got a copy. There was an exhibit in 2010, I forgot the date. Okay, but fortunately, They wrote back to Stuyvesant. These people, they travel and trade in New Netherlands and live and remain there provided that the poor among them shall be supported by their own nation. So don't become a welfare on the, the social life. Don't become a government responsibility. You can stay so long as you've got people that are willing to support you. Those 23 people. They were not allowed to build 
a house of worship. Stuyvesant wouldn't let any churches be built unless it was such reformed. Finally, in 1830, they were able to build their own synagogue. It was called Shirat Israel, which translates in Hebrew to remnants of Israel. And they sure were remnants of Israel. It was down on South William Street. At the time, it was called Mill Street. That was renamed. Today, it's this coffee shop. <laughs> it's 23 South Mill Street. But what I wanted to show you was this is what it started as. If you go down to 50 West 86th Street in Manhattan, this is what it is today. Okay, 80 West 70th Street, excuse me. And true to its Spanish and Portuguese heritage, this is called the Spanish and Portuguese Synagogue, and it is just as impressive on the inside as it is on the outside. Okay, I had to leave out a bunch. It's 3.15, I promise to be finished by then. Any other questions before we break up? And first, let me thank you all very, very much.